This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. Welcome in to the latest edition of the Motor City Sports Rant. We are at episode 178. I am the doc, John Macaroon. Jason will be joining me shortly. He's going to arrive in the studio, and I know both of us, we are excited, ready to talk about the Detroit Lions, their collapse versus the LA Rams. The game was there for the Lions, there for them to go out there and take advantage of a team, really, uh, the Rams that came in and looked unprepared. And it really is a sad state for the Detroit Lions to realize that teams come in here and when you go and you sit down sometimes as a Lions fan, you kind of recognize and you're realistic and you tell yourself, okay, the Lions are likely not going to defeat the LA Rams. The Rams got a great offense. They got a great young offensive mind. Sean McVay has the team coming in at 10-1. and They have something to play for, being that if they won the game, they would win the division and clinch a playoff berth for the second consecutive year after uh, prior to McVeigh arriving there going 4 and 12 they go out there and they rejuvenate the entire franchise by bringing in a young innovative mind something that the Lions did but on the defensive side of the ball so the, you thought that the Rams had something to play for they're going to come in and absolutely dominate i mean we took tweets on our twitter page at detroit podcast that maybe the rams would maybe de- defeat the detroit lions something along the lines of 68 to 3 you know some people tweeted us 75 to 15 and so you sit down and you go okay you know what maybe this isn't a game that the lions are going to win but can they compete can they go out there and put on an entertaining product? A lot of people went out to Ford Field to see the Rams because they are potentially a team that could represent the NFC in this year's Super Bowl. And the Rams come out and give the Lions defense a little bit of credit. They come out and they handle their business. They kind of, you know, shake things up and they put pressure on Jared Goff. And Goff doesn't play well. The Rams offense doesn't play well throughout the first half. And the Lions defense give them credit. They got they put a lot of pressure. Uh, they hung with the Rams, and the Rams did kind of look like. And some people, you know, messaged us and said, "Look, the Rams kind of look like they didn't really prepare all that seriously for the Lions. They kind of just assumed maybe, look, we're gonna roll up in here, handle our business, and leave." And that's kind of indicative of where the league views the Lions in that there haven't been a whole heck of a lot of games in the last maybe six to eight weeks that you can sit back and just go, wow, it was a shootout back and forth, both teams playing at an elite level. It just kind of seems like teams come here, make a bunch of mistakes, play poorly. Sometimes they leave with a victory. Sometimes they don't. But all in all, the quality of football that we're watching, you know, from the opponent that plays the Lions is really indicative of teams that really think that the Lions suck and they don't prepare as well because you've seen the Rams. You've seen what they're capable of. You've seen the offensive prowess that they have, and you thought that maybe they would come in and maybe put a hurting on the Lions, but they stuck with it, and unfortunately, a lot of things that go wrong with the Lions end up going wrong, especially this season in 2018 in the fourth quarter. Really disappointed in Matthew Stafford, disappointed in that offense, because if you're somebody that plays on the Lions, and you're a pro, and you play defense, you have every right, I think, to be upset. I think that players that are on the defensive side of the ball should really be upset because that unit, by all accounts, has gotten a lot better in 2018. You know, with the addition of Snacks Harrison, with a scheme that kind of looks like they can pressure the quarterback a little bit, they've gotten a little bit better, that unit, at stopping the run because earlier in the year, just any any team was able to just take advantage and have big runs and not allow the Lions offense to do some things. So you look at it and you go, okay, the game plan defensively, kind of held the Rams in check. And many people gave the Lions credit. Many beat writers are saying that 
that unit is the one of the bright spots in terms of getting better. The defensive line, the secondary, in certain plays, you got a chance to watch the secondary put a hurtin' on some of the Rams. You saw some, you know, some passion from the defense. You saw some big hits, legal hits. And, of course, you saw some of the wrinkles. You saw some of the things that have been terrible. Tease Tabor doesn't even get on the field. A healthy scratch. Nevin Lawson kind of got punked by Chris Spielman, who said, look, a guy like Nevin Lawson and his talent level, he should be clutching and grabbing as much as he could. He got away with one early in the game, but as the game went on, everybody noticed that he was a clutcher and a grabber, and he tried to cheat. But I was like, look, if you're Nevin Lawson, and I tweeted it out, if you're Nevin Lawson, you could do what you got to do. <laughs> if you got to cheat, you got to cheat. But the Rams took a bunch of penalties. Uh, they looked sloppy. Goff was throwing into triple coverage. That didn't look like the Jared Goff of before, but the Lions were still in it. But you look at the Lions, and they have to resort to uh, gimmick plays, and they have to resort to things outside the box in order to maybe even score a touchdown. But I can't wait to talk about the Lions with Jason Jarvie. He's here now. The Lions have resorted to gimmicks. That's how they got a score. And that's what I think Chris Spielman even said in the broadcast after halftime. One of his analysis was, look, what do you got to lose, really? The Lions, not a lot of wins on the year, not a lot of momentum. Just throw go balls to the wall. And that's what they did, you know, throwing a touchdown Fat guy touchdown to Taylor Decker, and like I said, Jason's here now, and he came in saying, look, Doc, I got to take all your tissue. Get your mind out of the gutter, not for that kind of thing. He's crying about the Lions, big Lions fan. I mean, both of us kind of said early on, before the draft, we said, maybe if you look at the schedule, maybe a chance for 10 wins, and then we kind of came to our senses and kind of put it at 7 and 9, but you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if this Sunday the Lions go out similar to what Arizona did to Green Bay. I wouldn't be surprised if the Lions lost on the road to Arizona. It's just one of those years, Jason, many people have said it's a lost year. Yeah, completely. And, uh, you know, walking in late and uh, live up to my my reputation. But uh, why? Yeah, I know. I know. I had to crack open one for, for myself. But watching that Lions game, I don't I don't watch it with any hope. I you know, I, I still root for them to win, but there's nothing at the end of the at the end of the road. Nothing you, at the end of the rainbow. It's a, it's an odd feeling because usually you should be mad that you're out of the playoffs like the Packers. They like they went out, they fired Mike McCarthy, who is a a fairly successful coach, but he's had a, a rough couple of years in Green Bay and they missed the playoffs and Green Bay fans are they should be angry. They have one of the best quarterbacks in the league. But I, I don't know. I I don't I'm not angry, but uh I'm I'm just kind of I don't know. I think part of the reason and I told Adam and everybody this in previous podcasts, once you kind of trade Golden Tate, you traded kind of a big cog on the team, a team leader, a guy that was productive, and so it signaled to everybody that, you know, the Lions organization after a terrible performance versus Seattle it signaled to everybody that they didn't believe in the 2018 team. And I had put an article up, and like I've said before, I felt like this year should be a tank year because they weren't going to compete. I know it shook out that the Central kind of looks weak and being maybe at 6-6 six and six could get you competitiveness in the division. There's no one really running away with it. But you look at it and you go, you know what? I think the organization is hampered by the fact that Bob Quinn came out and said that 9-7 is not good enough. But I do think this is just year one of Patricia trying to decide, okay, you're my guy, you're not my guy, and they're going to broom out a bunch of people and bring in guys that fit the system. But the problem is the asset that you would think is a guarantee to perform well, Matthew Stafford, looks really bad, and he's almost on pace now to get 20 turnovers for the year. A guy that you're paying a lot of money to just doesn't look right. Granted, you don't have Golden Tate, you don't have a security blanket, but in terms of what's going on, something is up with Matthew Stafford. He doesn't look right. I don't think he's checked out, but I just don't think that in terms of what he needs to be doing, the level of performance from Stafford, like we always talk about, just isn't good enough. But once you let go of Golden Tate, I, you can't help if you're a player of the Lions to just go, okay, the organization gave up on us, so what's really the point of fighting super hard 60 minutes, the grind it takes to to win a game? And you know what? I was thinking on the way over here, And I believe that this team has a new MVP on their team. Because I think in years past, I would have said Matt Stafford is hands down the MVP. He's got to, and he he has to be because he's the quarterback, he's the leader. And if he were to ever go down, 
then our team is just nothing. But I think at this point, you you want to take a guess who I think the new MVP of this team is? Probably somebody from the defense. Not on the defense. On the offense? It's on the offense. It's one of our newest players, Carrion Johnson. He hasn't been here in the last couple of weeks, and not having Golden Tate anymore, you you lose Marvin Jones for the year. You still have Kenny Galladay as a receiver, but you have nothing else. The run game was starting to pick up speed, and Carrion Johnson really added something that that just it's something that we've never had a a a explosive running back, somebody who can make a uh, make plays, and I think. You know, at this point, you think Matt Stafford, if he goes down, yeah, you know, we'd still be in a bad position. But if we were in an organization that actually, you know, prepared their roster and had a serviceable quarterback to come in over him, and we had a guy like Carrion Johnson, and we had Kenny Galladay, that we might actually be able to carry on, at least to, if we were in a, in a, in a winning position, to continue to get wins and maybe get into the playoffs. So it, it may be a little early, and it may be jumping the gun, but I think Carrion Johnson is that new X factor on this team. So is you think that's part of the reason why maybe you're a little bit more apathetic is that you're starting to realize, okay, we're playing now for 2019 and the season's over, and that probably was the watershed moment. Maybe that, along with playing bad in front of everybody, a national audience playing Seattle, I think everybody at that game saw and realized, oh, boy, in a time when you need to step up, you needed a big win, it didn't happen. They just don't win the games that they need to win. They go out and win games that they're not supposed to win. Like the Carolina game. Like That was a game that I'm, I was expecting them to just, you know, es- essentially what happened to them on, on Sunday against the Rams, to get housed. And they go out and they win. And it brings back some semblance of hope. And that really was this whole season. You know, going through the preseason, we had a little hope. Getting closer to the season, we were getting realistic that this team might have a bad year. And then they give us more hope at the beginning of the season, and now we're back down. And it's it's just a roller coaster, and it's I'm, I'm sick of it right now. You're sick of the roller coaster? I'm still going to watch, but it's just like, uh, you know, it's the Lions. It's the Lions. And Jason, do you realize 25 years without winning the division? 25th anniversary and uh, not being able to win the division. Can you believe that? Something that, you know, futile is what we're talking about with the Lions. 25 years since they won the the division, the Central. Crazy to talk about. It's crazy. It's... Well, you look at the the Rams game, and I I started the show talking about this. I was kind of hoping for maybe, you know, the greatest show on turf. I was hoping the Rams would light it up and Gurley would run all over the place. I was hoping Brandon Cooks was going to have a larger game for my fantasy. Right. And so you look at it, and I just kind of started the show by saying, you know what sucks is the perception of the Lions league-wide is that they're pushovers because a lot of teams come in and play their worst game against the Lions. A lot of mistakes, Jared Goff throwing in the triple coverage. It didn't seem like the Rams took the Lions that seriously, and they came in and put on a performance that, you know, yeah, they scored 30, but they were sloppy. They took a lot of penalties. They didn't look good. And you realize, man, the league just comes in and goes, ah, it's kind of like a bye week, a mini bye week. Yeah, we got to play hard, but, you know, the the Rams showed up with their D performance and won by 14. Pretty that's, much. I mean, that, that's crazy to think about. They didn't give the ball nearly enough to Todd Gurley because Todd Gurley should have just ran all over us. Right? And you look at it and you go, wow, Jared Goff was throwing the ball all over the place and you saw that offense. Many people are talking about that offense, Jason. You heard the audible boos. You know, late in the game when it was third down and they did a hand inside handoff. I mean, I bolded it on Twitter. Inside handoff, third down. Yep. Uh, you know it's bad when I get on Twitter and I tweet something. Yeah. Like, it, it's just when, what was it? It was it was in the first half or the second half when they were, they got something called back and they just, on third and long, instead of actually going for it, yeah, just a shotgun halfback draw and it's, it's apathetic. It's a situation, and, and then they pay, then they show Matt Patricia on, on the screen, and he and he's just nodding his head. Yep, yep, good play, good play, good call, right? And it was just the crowd was absolutely livid. They were pissed. I used that one guy. Did they? Did you yeah, see him? he was like, he's like yeah. <laughs> and then they scored. He's like, yay! And then he was sad at the end. But one big talking point that we talked about on Twitter was Chris Spielman on the broadcast basically made an excuse for the Lions' offense and said, "Look." 
Matthew Stafford doesn't have weapons, and this is what they're resorted to doing is that they have to use gimmicks. Uh, they can't really do a whole heck of a lot because there's not a lot of talent. But a lot of smart fans have said the same thing. They said, what did we really do with Calvin Johnson? Not a whole heck of a lot. And they said Stafford has had weapons. They just want to look at the fact that no more excuses. It's not a time now in 2018 after 10 years in an offense and playing football that you realize, wow, Matthew Stafford, you can't rely upon him. That's the one thing is that I wonder in the meeting room when Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia talk about the Lions and the organization, are they just lining up for maybe one run with Stafford? Because I don't see consistent 10 wins out of Stafford because if you can't get 10 wins out of a year like this when early in the year when you had your players, you weren't that good. You still were under 500. I think with Stafford, the expectation has to be load up for one run and then move on. I think that's basically the ceiling for Matthew Stafford. I don't see I'm five, not sure six years of playoffs. Get, I'm not sure if we're ever going to get to that point, though. Not even that, huh? Because I think he's hit a ceiling, and the excuses, they can't be there anymore. I think for the longest time, and I myself have been giving that excuse that they just, he doesn't have the weapons around him. He doesn't have the running back. He doesn't have, you know, the slot wide receiver. And it's just, he has he can't step up. He can't get up and take control of a game, not like Drew Brees, not like Tom Brady, not like we've seen Aaron Rodgers do before. And those guys have done it with less than great talent. They've done it with guys lesser than Calvin Johnson. You know, Aaron Rodgers is doing it with a bunch of scrubs or wide receivers. He's got guys like Marquez Scaldez Vantling or whatever his name is. He's got Equinemius St. Brown as a wide receiver. Geronimo Allison. Do you even know that these are are football players? I could just be naming these guys off the top of my head, but they're actual football players, and they somehow make it work. Tom Brady, for the longest time, you know, he never had a star wide receiver. You know, one of his his first Super Bowl wins, the the big the David or what is it? I don't even remember. David Patton was the Giants, but he's he's had nobody as a wide receiver. So it's like, man. You're so step good. up. You have it. Step you up. just need to you need to take control of that game. You need step to be up. Keanu Reeves in the replacement and you got to you got to take the ball at the end of the game. Many people are ready to move on and they realize, "Wow. Yeah, you know, maybe 2019 might be it for Matthew Stafford. It might be a make or break year where after next year you might be even, you know, willing to trade him and let him go because the cap hit won't nearly be as bad after next year." Is it the end? Is this the beginning of the end of Stafford? I mean, it might be. And I just don't see the whole scenario of gearing up for one big run because if the way that I would want to see it is Matt Patricia builds this franchise, Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn build this franchise the way that they envision it. And I don't think the way that they envision building this franchise is going out and signing a bunch of, of big name players in, in free agency and you know trading picks and trying to get big names in the draft and they should be building this team the right way you know build it through the defense you know get quality guys get guys that fit the scheme and i just that's not i don't think it doesn't fit with what stafford what stafford needs to actually be successful right now man disappointing season all the way around so what do you expect out of the next four games do you think the the lines have quit on patricia that Actually, some of the stuff that was talked about early in the year has come true now that they pulled the plug that, you know what, it's a business decision similar to what Odell did late in the game, not diving for that football. Have the Lions basically made a business decision and said, look, let's just, you know what, if we're going to be here, uh, let's just half-ass it. And, and those of us that don't need to be here, then it's, uh, you know what, a situation in which sometimes leaving the Lions is better for you, a la Eric Ebron. You know what? Losing out and not giving out, you know, not getting hurt, the risk of injury, and you go, you know what, maybe I can go to a real team and and compete because something's going on because if you pay attention online too, other players from time to time will get on Twitter and start making fun of the Lions, the organization, and Sue kind of said, you know, I'm not going to talk about the organization and stuff like that. So sums up, and and, and I don't know if it's just talent. You know, I don't want to say that this team has quit on Matt Patricia, they may be just coasting the rest of the way. They know that they're not getting into the playoffs. So I see this as a as even Matt Patricia and all them, 
This is a, an evaluation period of seeing what's go- who's going to carry over into next year and where's the dead weight that we can cut. And I hope that that's what they're doing because if they're not, then they're just spinning their wheels and just prolonging the inevitable. So I don't need to see them go out and win these next four games. It doesn't really matter if they win or lose to me. I just want to have an idea that they're moving in the right direction. Do you feel that way? Is it time to maybe start looking upward and say, Bob Quinn has put together this garbage, and Bob Quinn, had he maybe made different decisions, maybe you could have went out and now hired McCarthy if you waited, or maybe you could have picked up McVay. You know, it just kind of seems like you might have hired the coach at the wrong time. You could have stuck with Caldwell one more year. Maybe you could have picked up McCarthy next year, and then you realize, wow, you could have just had a seamless transition. There's there's always going to be a coach somewhere. Do you really want McCarthy? You want the the shell of what he is now? Do you think he can really recapture what he did in Green Bay, having two of the best quarterbacks of all time in Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers? I'm not sure if he could do that. You know, there's there's only so much a guy can do. So what I want to see is them really evaluate what they have in their coaches, specifically Jim Bob Cooter. The Whatever Matthew Stafford says, it's got to go out the window. If If Matt Patricia... If he's truly comfortable with Jim Bob Cooter running this offense for another year and trying to stick with what we're doing, then I will start to be concerned. Arizona, real quickly. Can the Lions go out there and, and defeat a team that's won, what, three or four games? I think they can. You know, Josh Rosen is not a he's not a good quarterback yet. He may develop, but you know, David Johnson is another good weapon, and they have a decent defense. I'm just, I, it's a toss up. It's 50 50. Yeah, I think we can both sense in our voices the passion for the Lions just when you watch it four and eight. And you just had a chance in the division, too. This division was there for the taking. If they were six and six right now, they could be actively in the mix to get in the playoffs. The NFC is not, you know, no one in the NFC is running away with everything. So it's a, it's a tough situation. And I just think that when you look at the Lions, I just think that. It's time to look at the draft, time to look at what players can help on the defense. What is Bob Quinn going to actually say when he does address the media? It's time to kind of look at the future, and it's just tough because a lot of fans, it's just really hard to really take the concept of next year. Because and I'm it's always not sure year. what we're going to get in the draft. It, right. You know, this these draft pools, I feel like they're getting slimmer and slimmer. Like, the guys after number after five, it's, it's basically just a crapshoot, you know? Look at a guy like Eli Harold. You know, he he went high. He went to San Francisco, didn't really do much. Now he's on our team. He's having some success, but it's a it's a guy who went in the first round who isn't living up to his potential. So it's like, what are what are we really going to get in the draft? And can we really be that excited? I'm Unless we're fuck your ass, and then you're going to be humble. <laughs> yeah. I played that for Adam, and he died laughing. I was like, Jason told me it. I liked it. I found the Iron Sheik soundboard, and I was like, oh, my God, that's some funny stuff there. The Break Iron your back, Sheik. make you humble. Break your back, make you humble. Being a Lions fan, you just got to be humble, unfortunately. Break my back, and I don't think they make me humble because I'm, <laughs> I'm just upset. No joy. Yeah, we're upset. We'll come back. We'll just talk about Michigan State, uh, the end of the year. They're in a bowl game, and actually a Ooh, better— Red uh, Box. Red Box. You're listening to the Motor City Sports Rant on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Jason, I want to tell you about the Motor City Pawn Brokers, a great sponsor of the network. The Motor City Pawn Brokers are the one-stop pawn shop when you're in need of short-term cash or are looking for quality brand-name new and pre-owned merchandise. With locations in Detroit, Ferndale, Roseville, and Warren, their mission is to deliver exceptional value. Go definitely check out MotorCityPawnBrokers.com, and if you're in the area, stop in. A great place to check out great deals on quality brand name new and pre-owned merchandise. The Motor City Pawn Brokers. Every day I'm hustling. 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 Every day I'm. Every day I'm. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. All right, Jason, a lot of people are talking about it. The college football playoff is set. Ohio State, not in it. Michigan, not in it. Michigan State, definitely not in it. Um, Real quickly, are you in favor of the four teams that made it? Oh, yeah. I I totally believe that. I mean, Alabama, 
Clemson and Notre Dame absolutely deserved it. I was, you know, I was watching that SEC game really closely because that would have made it interesting. Because if Alabama loses to Georgia, I think again we'd have two SEC teams because Alabama doesn't deserve to get knocked out of the playoffs because they would lose to the number four team. So it that one two three went the way that I absolutely thought it was going to be. And then when it comes down to essentially Oklahoma and Ohio State, Oklahoma completely deserved it. And you look at my main thing that I look at is the loss. And you have uh, Oklahoma who lost to Texas by three, avenged it in their Big Twin Big Twelve championship game, and you have Ohio State who got blown out by Purdue. So it it really is no question for me. Yeah, and for those that want to see expansion, I just think that. College football is really great. Each contest it means so much. Michigan's loss earlier in the year loomed so large. That contest versus Ohio State was for, for it all, basically, in the Big Ten. And then you look at Alabama, Georgia. The games would have been coached differently. It would have you know taken different tones. And so I sit here realizing that the college football regular season means a lot. And I, I like it the way it is. I could, for those that do want to see a couple more teams, I'm only then going to be in favor of if you are going to expand it, not to go to eight, go to six. First two teams get a bye. That way all the Power Five conferences get in, and then you can get one at large, maybe like a Central Florida. I don't think you give automatic bids to conference champions. No, it's not. Sometimes it's not worth it. That's not worth it because let's say Northwestern beats Ohio State. They do not deserve to be in in the college football playoff. That, That makes zero sense. They would not be the number six team. So it's... It, I do agree. I think six would be. I'd like to see what would happen at that point because I, I do kind of want to see if UCF could actually get in there. And I'm not sure where did they. Do you know where they ended up in the college football rankings? I'll look it up right now. But I do think it's top top ten. Top ten. So I think they do kind of deserve a chance to to at least get in there. I mean, they have been undefeated for the past two seasons now, and I know. Probably going into that decision was that they lost their star quarterback. And even though that they, they did win their conference championship, it was kind of a close game against Memphis. So eight, number eight. They were number eight. So it went Alabama. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have even even won. They yeah. wouldn't have even gotten in at six. Say it was Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, five Georgia, six Ohio State, seven Michigan, eight UCF, nine Washington, ten Florida. You have See, eight. And, and, I'll make, and I'll make Michigan fans unhappy, but I think UCF should probably be ahead of Michigan. Oh, really? Uh, the, the competition that they play is not really as good. I, I get it. I get it. But they've been undefeated for two complete seasons. And I don't I don't condone their their national championship that they crowned themselves last year. I'll ask you this. Is there a way to make the Bulls more relevant? Because obviously Michigan fans are pissed that they're playing in the Peach Bowl. Michigan State's going out to California. They're playing in the you know Red Box Bowl versus Oregon. I just don't, for me personally find myself all that interested in those kind of matchups. Absolutely not. There's there's right. no way to make these bowls interesting. The For Michigan State it's, though, it's bloated. For Michigan State though, if you just look at Michigan State Oregon, Michigan State could go into that game pretty healthy and we could actually maybe see what the team could have looked like this year, but I just think that Does it's it make you feel any better? Maybe when you watch it, you could go. Maybe it's like kind of like a preseason game. You just kind of look at it and you go, um, who's going to be a contributor next year? Can Lewerke actually complete a pass with guys around that are healthy that can catch the ball? And you and you go, you need something to kind of get renewed hope with the Spartans because this year took a lot out of out of fans. It was so bad offensively that you lost to Michigan, you lost a lot of games, you're barely above five hundred. You're playing in the Red Box Bowl. Really, in the end, it's embarrassing. Great, all, you're playing on New Year's Eve, but it's not a really a marquee bowl, and it means nothing. All these games are just a pat on the back and to make yourself feel good. I I listened to the radio station. I, I have to say that listeners kill me. It, like it, it almost makes me not want to listen anymore because listeners are so dumb. It, 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 it kills me. And I was listening one time, and some blowhard Michigan fan called in, and it was, it was before the, the championship games. And he's like, I'm just saying that let's say Ohio State loses. Let's put... Ohio State and Michigan in a bowl game. And then we hit the revenge tours back on. You're a fucking asshole! And it, like, I'm just, <laughs> I'm listening to that, and it, it hurts my head. This is Arden Sheik. Really? 
<laughs> it, it, it kills me. It doesn't yeah. mean anything. The revenge tour is over when you got blown out. You're right. That was done. Revenge tour canceled. But I look at it for Michigan State and I say, I still don't think that in 2019 that they, they're going to revolutionize that offense. Michigan, Michigan State, the Lions, really in an age when the entire country has kind of decided that it's an offensive time. It's a, it's a period of time as a football fan when you can go and watch games like 50 to 40. You see Alabama, Georgia, great entertaining quality speed. And then you got Michigan, Michigan State and the Lions that have these antiquated, awful offenses that have no innovation that you watch and you just go, man, these guys don't put asses in the seats and it's not entertaining enough to make it justified to go, man, in a big game, Michigan didn't do all that much, went with the notion of run, 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 and let's see what happens. Didn't take a whole heck of a lot of shots with those great wide receivers. Michigan State, throughout the year, you you look at them and you go, man, in situations where in a big game versus Michigan, you have less than 100 total yards. It, and and I, I just sometimes I wish teams would take the stance like Green Bay did. If it's that bad, you can fire a coach midway through the year and just start the process of change. And unfortunately, Kingsbury now went to uh, USC. He's not coming to the state of Michigan to coach anywhere. And I just don't see, I, obviously, the next offensive mind is an assistant that I'm hearing a name out of L.A., uh, a, pl- a guy that's really close to Sean McVay. He's kind of his number two. He's probably going to be the next guy that's going to make the circuit and make the rounds. But you realize there's better jobs, you know, the Browns and the, and the Packers and things like that. And in the world of college, there's nobody really up and coming that you, when, when people say, well, who's next? Who's going to come in here and try and fix the offense for Michigan and Michigan State? I just don't see a, lot, a heck of a lot of names. And the thing is, is... None of the none of the coaches have pressure on them. You know, there really isn't. We, you, you, we can say all we want that Mark D'Antonio is on the hot seat. Mark D'Antonio isn't on the hot seat. He has tenure. He's done so much for this team and the that school that he's. It's truly good unless it gets really really bad. It he's going to be there until he decides he doesn't want to be there anymore. And unless and I. I say the same for Jim Harbaugh. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna be essentially Lloyd Carr. He's gonna hey he'll get nine wins. He might beat Ohio State every year or so, and you know he'll put up a good fight against Michigan State. Maybe they'll go back and forth every every year or so. But none of those guys they don't have the pressure on them. Jim Harbaugh may have more of the pressure on him because he is a crazy person and he hasn't actually won anything for that team yet. But really, there's there's no pressure on those guys. They aren't on the hot seat. Not on the hot seat. That's the thing. I think that's something that is really key in terms of when you're at a program like Michigan, Michigan State, and there's not a lot of oversight, not a lot of people clamoring right now for for a bunch of change. I mean, obviously, Michigan State, people were disappointed, but he can always sit back and say, look, I've done it once. I've taken this, or, you know, I've taken this program to the college football playoff, uh, something that in Ann Arbor never happened. And so you look at Michigan, you go, from where we were, we were losing games that we weren't supposed to lose. Now we're winning 10 games. We're just trying to get now over the hump. And you look at it like, what's their motivation to change? I think their motivation to change is the notion that competing in the Big Ten is not good enough anymore. That the notion is, you know what, the ultimate prize is to try to be number one overall in the entire country. And the path to be number one is to have a better offense that scores points. Especially when you look at it, when you throw the ball and, you know, People in the secondary, they just have it so tough. You can't clutch. You can't grab. Everything's getting called. It's a game of speed, and it's a game of passing. It's an offensive league in college and the pros. But unfortunately, we're not the beneficiary of watching it unless you watch SEC football, which I don't watch a whole heck of a lot. I watch Big Ten football, and it is grinded out and really tough. So it's unfortunate. Unfortunate stuff for us football fans in the state of Michigan, especially me, you know, being a Spartan supporter, uh, going through this year and being a Lions fan, especially with the way the games have shook out, a lot of boring games. And so you look at it and you go, okay, the guy I'm going to be looking at really in terms of the game is Justin Hebert, a guy that's uh, it's going to be projected to be a top 10 pick, don't you think? I mean, yeah, he'll probably be a top 10 pick. I don't think he should be the Lions' top 10 pick. No, but uh, do you think Michigan State can go out there and go out west and defeat Oregon? Oregon's had history of uh, some success against Michigan State. Yeah, but I think we've had our successes against yep. Oregon too, so... It's again. It's a it's a fifty fifty game. It doesn't really mean anything to anybody. 
I don't think there's we're going to have any players who are going to sit out because of the draft like Michigan might have. Uh, like if I was Rashawn Gary, I would definitely not play in the Peach Bowl because I'm getting ready for the draft and getting my money. So I think Michigan State totally has a chance to to go out there and beat Oregon. Yeah, Rashawn Gary, uh, a guy that uh, definitely it's already made the decision. It's announced. I probably would assume that Chase Winovich probably won't play either, and I think it's smart not to. Uh, it's a risk. Cause look that, at Jake. That, look at Jake guy. Butt. Jake Butt risked it all, lost the season. I know, but I I see, I see the whole I see the resemblance between Winovich and Butt. Where, you know, I think Rashawn Gary. When he went to Michigan, he was basically just a stopgap until he got to the NFL. I think Chase Winovich, he feels a little bit more for this Michigan team, so I could see him playing in the game. All right, sir, what you got upcoming? What's on your mind in the world of sports? Anything to pay attention to? I definitely enjoyed the boxing draw between Wilder and Tyson Fury. They definitely should do it again, but boxing, always a little bit shady, coming up with a draw when most people thought Wilder won the fight. Anything else catching your eye? Pistons, wings? Obviously, the Pistons and the wings. Yeah. You know, the last couple seasons, it's been brutal to to bring up and winning right and yeah i I, you know i definitely feel a certain way about the pistons and and we can get into that in in future episodes yep but i i totally believe even though the pistons are doing really well they're on they're resting on like the ankles of reggie jackson and blake griffin you know one tweaked ankle that could be your season right there i'll ask you this to wrap up this podcast Lions and Wings, should they just tank? Because a lot of people are like, whoa, in the last you know few games, I think the, the Red Wings are 11-4-1. They yeah, they're like one of, of the hottest teams in the, like over the, a period of time. I think this year could have been a tank year, though. Man, lose for Hughes is not really going to go down. I don't think it's going to happen. But don't you want to see some sort of success out of these young players? That's what we've wanted yeah. for the last couple of years. We wanted to see the young guys play. and One more year is all we needed, but it didn't happen. But the, it only... It's, it has to spell some sort of success. And the Lions right now, as we sit, drafting fifth. So lose out. If you win four games, you know, I said go 5-11 and 11, uh, at the start of the year and just said, look, the opportunity presents itself. You're going to draft fifth. You have an opportunity with some leverage maybe to move down and get some more picks. So Who do they got? They got so they got, well, they got three games left. Got Cardinals. Oh, wait. Four games. Oh, sorry. There's an ad blocking it. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, ESPN, making me look dumb. Cardinals. I, th- I think they probably win that game. Yeah. Uh, no, they're just on the road, so they lose. Okay. Uh, Bills on the road. Probably a loss. I think that's a loss, too. Bills Mafia, freezing cold game. Vikings at home. Loss. Probably. Might be a purple house. And then Packers to close the season in Green Bay. Maybe Okay, you know what? Two and two. They're probably going to go two and two. So it's probably going to be then what? A uh, six and ten year. Maybe draft ninth. Well, that's the way it is with the Lions. I think it's safe to say that the Lions draft within the top 15. You can follow Jason on Twitter at Jarvie the King. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If there's anything at all that you've heard that you want to comment on, feel free to leave a message. You can leave a voicemail, 248-579-8686. Thank you so much for downloading another episode. We'll bring it strong again on the next edition of the Motor City Sports Rant. Thanks, Jason, for coming in. Always good seeing you, my friend. I know. Thanks for not big-timing me again. No worries. (laughs) Talk soon, Jason. Later. Okay, nice, idiot. Uh Uh-huh, f*** you. Bye-bye. Good day, sir. I said good day. All right. Take care now. Bye bye then. Loser. <laughs>